welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 188, featuring the final part of my interview with Mr. Joel Billings, the founder and president of Strategic Simulations Incorporated. This part of the interview, we talk about the decline and fall of SSI, the reason this great company is no longer around. You get to hear all the inside scoop on the shenanigans with electronic arts, my escape, the Dougherty brothers, and much, much more. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Joel Billings. What yeah. happened in 1994 with uh, Mindscape? I mean, it seems like you were really doing well with the, uh, you know, Panzer General selling all these copies and everything. Well, actually, what happened was Panzer General came out right after the acquisition. So what happened was in 19 in early '93 when uh, we had our layoff and we basically had to scale back because we started losing money. SSI had always made money. And been profitable every year and then in 92 early 93 we were not and we were losing money and we were investing i think uh the dark sun project was like a million dollar project and when you throw in uh, the others we'd never invested that much money in development before and because we weren't we didn't have a, a lot of money behind us uh we really were at a crossroads for the company we either had to uh, go out and get funding or sell the company and you know find a bigger company that wanted our development expertise. So those were the really the choices. And luckily, you know, very it, basically when we retrenched in early 93, we immediately turned profitable month to month. So we had to have that layoff, unfortunately, as tough as it was for everybody. And uh, but we got profitable again. And then Dark Sun came out in September. And from that Basically, you know, we were out of the worst of it, but we also saw the handwriting on the wall. The industry was changing. I mean, you had video games were in, and SSI was not a big player in video games. We couldn't get in. We didn't have the money to be a player. And uh, the projects, even on the PC, were getting more and more expensive. So, you know, SSI was a family business, and it was no longer a family industry. <laughs> and so we had to make that decision. So, I decided that uh, it would be better to try to look for somebody to, to acquire us than to try to grow ourselves to be a bigger company. And so we had several deals that, that didn't go through. We, we were talking with, uh, 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 who was it? Yeah, Spectrum Holobyte. I don't know if you remember them. They, they did Falcon, I think it was. And in summer of 93, we were literally, we, we had had some conversations for a month or two, and we were, they were very seriously interested. They had big venture funding of their own, so they could, they could afford to buy us and fit in with their plans. And so here we were, we were about to like sign a, a letter of intent, and then they went off to CES. And do you remember Microprose? Okay. Well, that was the CES where Micropro suddenly couldn't make payroll and were desperate and needed to also find somebody or some, some way to, to get through. So here we are. We literally were, okay, we're going to sign that letter of intent next week. They go off to see to the show. They come back. Well, we signed a deal with Micropros. <laughs> so, sorry. And so that, that deal went away because they basically ended up acquiring Micropros. So, okay, so, you know, the, you know, everybody involved and from our end, we're like, oh, okay, uh, well, now that, let's look elsewhere. So we started looking at Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts owned 20% of us. At one point, right before D&D, &D, uh, uh, the pool of radiance came out, we made a deal with them where they bought 20% of SSI, and in return, we became an affiliated label of Electronic Arts. So... We started looking at Electronic Arts, and Electronic Arts had a business development manager who used to work at SSI, actually, and he was interested in acquiring SSI. So we had long discussions over that summer. Literally, it was, it was sent to their board of directors meeting. They were supposed to you know, approve the, the acquisition. And uh, uh, Trip Hawkins didn't make it to that meeting. Trip Hawkins had been on our board of directors at SSI before he started EA. So there had been sort of a long history, but then we sued him over Questron too. So there'd been sort of, you know, good and bad stuff going on. But uh, basically he didn't, he didn't make it to the meeting 
where the SSI acquisition was brought up. This is my understanding, because his wife had a baby and right before, you know, was and he was called away to the hospital right before the meeting. So Steve Salyer goes into the board meeting or whatever to the to pitch that and some opposition to the acquisition gets brought up. Trip isn't there. The deal dies. It's blown up. And everybody at EA even was like, you know, they couldn't believe that it was that the deal got killed. So here in like four months, we had just had two big companies, you know, two big deals just go away unexpectedly. So that was that was a really rough roller coaster. And uh, so then let's see, that was, yeah, 93. And so then, you know, we sort of kept going and we knew we still wanted to have somebody acquire us. And uh, but things were starting to go pretty well. You know, Dark Sun came out. We, we were making money again. So we weren't as desperate in some ways to, to sell. And then uh, eventually Mindscape came in and uh, we made the deal in 94. And that deal happened in October 94 and Panzer General came out in November. So it would have been interesting if Panzer General had come out not under Mindscape. <laughs> yeah, that would have been, we would have done well. But we had a problem we, we, as an affiliate label of Electronic Arts, we had a real business problem. They were making too much of the profits. And we were locked into the deal as long as they own part of our stock. And the only way we could get out of that was to buy the stock back. And we could only buy the stock back if they, at a, at, it was based on our sales as what the price was. So we had actually been buying back some of the stock. But as our sales went up, the price went up. So our ability to buy the stock back got harder. But the, our sales went up. Our profits did not go up. So our profits were running lower, you know, lower percentage of sales, sales are going up. So the price to buy our stock back was getting higher. We had less money to buy it back with. We were really in a, in a tough situation and we knew that we had to get to a better deal as, as being an affiliate label of EA was, was, you know, it was good in its time, but we'd gotten bigger you know, we'd gotten so big, we didn't need to be an affiliate label of, of EA, and they were just taking too much. So that was the, the business dilemma that we found ourselves in. And, what, was uh, that, yeah, what was that about Questron 2? Questron 2 was uh, uh, the, the Dougherty brothers did Questron for right. us, and we had the rights to do a Questron 2. Uh, the rights, we had first right of refusal to the sequel. We always had first right of refusal for follow-on products from our authors. So, and what that was supposedly meant was that some they could go to another company and that company could put up an offer sheet and say, this is what we're willing to pay in royalties and advances. And if we said, okay, we'll match that offer sheet, then that's it. We get that deal and we go forward. The Dougherty brothers did not want to go with us. They wanted to go to uh, Electronic Arts. And so they ended up, they, they basically made it very difficult uh, for both parties, from what I can tell, uh, in that they weren't being straight with us about what was going on. And they wouldn't, you know, we just kept saying, give us the offer sheet. We'll tell you if we want to match it or not. You know, that's where it's going to be. And they never did it. And EA was like trying to, if I remember right, EA was at one point they were trying. I'm not sure if I'm getting this confused with another situation, but they they were sort of trying to to. Uh, they, I mean, they wanted to get Questron too, clearly, but they were trying to do something so it wouldn't be a problem with us. But in the end, we never got the offer sheet. We never were given the chance to match the the refusal, and they went ahead. And I think what they were doing was basically changing the I, idea was they were going to change the game to something else. I, I'm not sure what it was. So we ended up suing them. We basically had to sue them over the fact that we weren't given our first right of refusal. And uh, we settled it with them. And the way it was settled was that, that we would get Questron, we would get a Questron product and they would get their product. And that's what ended up happening. So, and it was, it was a pain. Real pain. So yeah, so we had literally settled this lawsuit probably within with them within twelve months of when they acquired twenty percent of us, which just shows you that you know you have to forget lawsuits after they have 
because it's sort of a, a risk, a certain risk of business. It sounds like SSI certainly had its share of uh, ups and downs. I'm just wondering, is there one particular moment that you, if you had a time machine and can go back and change something, is there one moment that really stands out? Hmm. Wow. I mean, nothing, I, yeah, nothing, I don't have anything in the that pops to mind. So I haven't really uh, thought too much. I think, uh, you know, the, the one you know, the, the big decision was obviously to sell the company to Mindscape. And, and in there's, you know, you can argue that both ways. I think ultimately we needed to sell to somebody and it's unfortunate in a way that it turned out the way it did with Mindscape. But then again, there weren't that many companies that, you know, to sell to. So I'm not sure, you know, what else, but the unfortunate part was, yeah, the way the, the Mindscape thing ended up going. So as far as SSI, because you know that's basically how SSI doesn't really exist anymore as a as a brand or anything. Whereas it probably had it been at some somewhere else, it might still exist as a brand at least. Well, now you're back to doing what you always have loved to do, making a war games with mm -hmm. a two by three. Just wondering what your plans are for the future of the company. Well, we're we're. Pretty much, we're a small group, so we're very focused on our War in Europe series, and that's pretty much the the main emphasis. So we we did War in the East, which was the Russian front. Now we're doing War in the West, uh, forty three to forty five. We'll eventually do, hopefully, the earlier parts of World War Two in Europe, and then we'll, if we live so long and you know are that ambitious, we'll try to put it all together into a massive War in Europe game and all of that work is probably going to take us you know years you know five six seven years to to do all of that and but with hopefully these various products in the meantime the one in, other interesting thing we're doing is uh uh our um, world at war product is getting uh, put over onto the ipad uh we've got somebody doing an ipad version of world at war which was our simple sort of Axis and Allies style game. That was very ungary like very un the non-Grigsby, Grigsby game. So, but I think it was, you know, it, it, for what it is, it's really good. It just doesn't have that detail of every pilot named. It's more uh, like the old style uh, board games, like I say, like Axis and Allies, but with a lot more detail than that. So anyway, it's going to the iPad, so we'll see what how that goes. We have no idea what that market would be like and that's probably the only game we've done that would even be at all suitable so there's some other games that you know I, i'd love to do but we don't really have the the technical expertise to do and when you talked about you know before like why we didn't do i the beholder in house or something uh, a big big part of it is uh you know the graphics or the real-time programming uh kind of uh, skills and abilities and so there are some things that, that I find interesting to do in like a real-time war game environment but that's just we don't have that kind of uh, expertise so you know someday maybe we'll we'll run into somebody who has it and maybe something will come of that and what I find fascinating about two by three what I really enjoy about it is that you know, with Skype now and, and the internet and the home office, the virtual office, we really have a, a, a neat situation that we've never had before where we're working with people all around the world. And our, our testers are all around the world. We have our programming assets, our programmers, our artists, you know, they're all over and they can be anywhere. And so we never know literally when the next person who's going to be a major contributor to a, our, one of our games is going to show up. It could be the tester we add tomorrow could be the one that a year from now is programming, you know, a big contributor for us. So we've had a couple of people come in over the last couple of years that really do a, a, an amazing amount of, of stuff for us and, and have gotten us where we didn't think we'd be able to, to get there. So, so you never know. The Kai calling with a tech support question, right? That's what it comes <laughs> down to. So it's, it's still, you know, trying to be open to those possibilities that, that come in. So, and uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. This is a couple, just a couple last questions I have, uh, Joel. Uh, one is, have you considered a Kickstarter project? 
or trying to raise some money through that to make this million dollar plus game you were thinking about? I, you know, I've uh, some people have have suggested that, and uh, I haven't really seriously thought about it. But you know, maybe you know, down the road, uh, if if we find some people that uh, you know are interested in something, and we we get a sense that there's something that we can do, and that we're interested in doing, so I wouldn't rule it out. But you know, there's nothing imminent. All right, so the last question I have is something I try to ask everybody, but I think you're in a really good position to answer it because you've worked with so many different people and so many different positions and, of course, ran SSI. So uh, what would you tell a kid today that wanted to uh, get a career designing or developing games? I and mean, what can they do to prepare uh, for the industry, a good job in the industry? And then uh, what kind of things do you look for on a resume or if you're interviewing somebody? Hmm. I mean, I know it varies a lot depending on what they want to do, but if they're just sort of general yeah, things you look for? It really depends on what, what they want to do. But what I would tell somebody is uh, uh, just, you know, if, if you want to be in game design, play a lot of games. Uh, find a part, you know, it depends on what you're interested in. If you're interested in the art side or the programming side, I mean, it doesn't hurt to clearly get some programming skills. I think I had an advantage early on that I was... You know, I knew the war games in and out, so that was my expertise. Programming, I knew enough so that I could talk to programmers, and so that gave me the ability to to go back and forth. And I had the business background in school, so I could deal with the business side. So, you know, I had that. So, you know, even if you want to do game uh, development, uh, knowing some programming is is a good thing. Uh, but really, it's just you know, playing the games and, and, uh, and, and learning the skills. So if you're a programmer, try to, to, to learn. Uh, Keith Broers, he was a self-made programmer. I mean, he, he got hired in as a, as a customer support rep, basically, and uh, taught himself how to program in high school and just went from there. And so, you know, you can, you can do that. Uh, clearly... There's now, uh, my son is, is 14. He'd never play an SSI game, you know, but because he's not, he's not a, a serious uh, war gamer from that point of view. Uh, but uh, he has friends that are in various, uh, you know, high, art quest high schools that have art animation, computer animation programs. I mean, if you're interested, then those are, there are programs like that even in high school to uh, be able to, to learn some of those basic skills so and then uh, get involved in testing testing is you know we do all our testing as volunteers over the internet so volunteer you know find find games you're interested in and it's easier in, in I, with us with you know the small independent companies I don't know how you know major companies these days are are uh, doing things but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the design studios that do games for the bigger companies aren't using testers out there, you know, volunteer testers. So get out there in the forums, you know, be active, uh, and then try to get involved in testing products and learn about game development that way. So that would be what I would tell them to do. And uh, as far as uh, resumes, well, I'm not really looking at resumes these days, but uh, what I'm looking for. Uh, when I'm working with people in terms of uh, uh, getting involved and in doing more work with us than just testing is, you know, they're, uh, again, they're, they're, uh, uh, they, they need to have some experience, whether it's, it's technical on the computer or, you know, I'm looking to see what kind of computer experience they have or, and gaming experience they have, what games they played in the past. But then it really, it's uh, those guys who take charge and, the guys doing our data work now or whatever, they're just people who came in and tested and then started asking questions about certain areas and started making suggestions. And, and geez, those suggestions sound good. Well, you know, what, what do you think? Oh, yeah. Then they dive in. You know, now with so many of our games and uh, there's editors so people can go in and they can edit things. So that's another big thing to do. You know, get a game, edit, learn how to edit a game, make changes to it. And so the people that, uh, for us, are people who get in there and start editing and making changes, and 
and uh, show that they can do something. So then we're happy to give them more responsibility. Sure, you want to, want to improve this part of the game? Go, go right ahead. Well, thanks so much, Joel, for taking the time to chat with me today. Is there a website or a blog site or somewhere that uh, viewers can go if they want to learn more about you and your work? Uh, about me, well, there's, a, there's 2 by 3 gamescom uh, uh, that has a little bit of information about us, but we don't we don't update that very often. So, uh, but for our games, Matrix Games is our publisher, and so if you go to the MatrixGames.com site, go to the forums, and look look up our games like uh, War in the East or War in the Pacific, uh, you'll find out all kinds of things about our games there. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sure. curious. Uh, what is it? Looks like I'm seeing a box of five and a quarter inch discs in the background there on that shelf. Is that what that is? Uh, oh, like back here? Yeah, like on that middle shelf there. Yeah, is that a, what I think it is? Yeah, it actually it says SSI <laughs> Games on it. Wow. I don't know what's in here. This is some old thing. What is this? Yeah, there, there's CDs. There's Steel Panthers 3, Panzer General 2, yeah, looks like a few Panzer General, a few, this I have, I don't know, haven't used it in a long time. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode, hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with uh, Swin uh, from Larian Studios, maybe Dave, David as well. Uh, these guys are working on a Kickstarter for Divinity Original Sin, a classic turn-based style RPG set in their Divinity universe. You've probably heard of these guys, or at least the, uh, the uh, Divinity series. Uh, anyway, if you guys have questions or comments for them, uh, just post them here in the comment section or shoot me an email. Be sure to pass those on. Really looking forward to uh, this chat, uh, so hopefully that will come to pass. Uh, as always, uh, thank you if you have supported this show. It really means a lot to me, guys. If you would like to uh, support the show, just go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner, and you can set up a subscription or one-time payment. Either way, guys, I really, really, really appreciate that. Now, what about the hail of the week? Uh, as you probably know, it's Easter, so I distributed some Easter eggs around the uh, Matt Chat studio, and I was looking for an appropriate ale to uh, sort of you know, kiss this winter's ass goodbye. Hopefully get <laughs> get it into spring here soon. The snow is just starting to melt here. It's been really, really long and terrible winter. Uh, kind of like the uh, the winter portrayed here on this bottle of Isolation Ale. And this is from the Odell Brewing Company out of Fort Collins, uh, Colorado. A little story on the side. 6.1% uh, alcohol. Uh, I was looking to see what kind of style ale this is. It's a seasonal. But I really don't see anything. Let's see, a sweet caramel malty ale balanced by a subtle crisp hop finish. Uh, whether you ski, shred, or shoe, Isolation Ale will inspire you to make first tracks. Uh, lovely, lovely, lovely. But let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Isolation Ale here in the old rather excellent drinking horn. Uh, the smell of this is, you can definitely smell the, uh, the chocolatiness, the, the sort of maltiness they talked about. It almost tastes like your, I mean, uh, it smells like a Yoohoo you know, chocolate drink. So I think this is going to be pretty chocolatey. Anyway, let's give it a, let's give it a taste. Uh, that's uh, uh, quite smooth, uh, that. Kind of get a the sort of nuttiness aftertaste, um, like almonds or sort of uh, maybe roasted almonds with a little bit of chocolate mixed in. Kind of a coffee flavor. Just a little bit bitter. Uh, not much. Actually kind of a smooth, a sweet finish on this. I actually uh, quite like this uh, This one. It's really, really tasty. It's not uh, extremely flavorful, uh, but it is uh, very pleasant. The aftertaste is, uh, is quite nice. I'm going to go, uh, you know, maybe uh, I'm going to go... Uh, uh, three out of five, uh, very close to four out of five uh, drinking horns on this. Uh, definitely not not a bad ale at all, and uh, something that'd be quite nice to drink on a 
one of those cold winter days here in, in Minnesota. So, isolation nail, uh, good stuff. Uh, let's uh, wrap up with a quotation. And of course, uh, with the military theme, I want to go with uh, something from Napoleon uh, Bonaparte. And the quotation I found goes something like this. Revolution is an idea which has found its bayonets. See you guys next week. You know, there's like a buttload of gangs at this school. This one gang kept wanting me to join because I'm pretty good with the bow staff.